Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to NATO's 38th Annual Conference. We will be starting in about one minute. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. On your attendee screen, you can enter comments in the chat and questions in the Q&A. We hope you will take advantage of this opportunity to engage with our speakers and attendees. This session is being recorded. We recognize and thank the California Healthcare Foundation for being our Petabyte sponsor. Information about all conference sponsors is available in the sponsor area of the platform. Please take a few minutes to visit each sponsor's booth where you can find information about them and find game tokens. Game tokens are keywords or phrases used in the token hunt game for a chance to win a prize in our daily drawings. Now, let me turn the stage over to Norm Thurston, NATO's Executive Director. Norm, the stage. Uh, thank you, Erica. It's a joy to be with you again this week for our second Igniter uh, series session. This week's topic is emerging topics, and we have chosen as our emerging topic for this week, why health data organizations should care about artificial intelligence or AI as it is affectionately known in the techie world. So we're pleased to have with us today, Charles, let's go ahead and bring on stage our, our uh, speakers. Uh, today we have with us Bob Rebitzer from Manat Health and Devin Holgate from On Point Health Data. Their full bios are visible on your screen. If you just scroll down below your, uh, uh, I would guess like the, the video screen, you can see their full bios there. Um, but we're just going to go jump right into this. I'm going to ask each of them, Bob first and then Devin, just to take a couple of minutes and introduce your version of why health data organizations should care about AI. Bob? Thanks, Norm. I'm, it's a delight to be here and, uh, um, and, and to be with all of you. Uh, I think the, uh, my primary concern with uh, AI and why health data organizations should be concerned about it has to do with innovation. Uh, and uh, uh, our concern is that uh, AI may fall into a category like electronic health records before them of innovations that the system has trouble absorbing. And, uh, and uh, I think that there are three things that healthcare organizations can do and that I would want to ad uh, advocate that all of you who engaged uh, with healthcare organizations would encourage them to do. One is to change the narrative about HI and to view it more as a complement, as a, a, a tool that supports the physician-patient relationship rather than re replacing physicians or automating the job of physicians or providers. Uh, the second is to take great care with implementation, probably beginning more in the back office implement uh, uh, and moving slowly toward patient-facing uh, applications. And the third is to make sure that the public and providers have reason to trust that AI is an honest tool and not a biased or a, a tool that in some way uh, deprives them of essential rights. Uh, so the, uh, maybe I'll leave it at Dan Norm. Does that serve as a beginning? Yeah, very good, thank you. Devin? Hi, Norm. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, also excited to be here. Um, yeah, I guess my perspective on kind of why health data organizations should care about AI, I think I'll start from a, kind of a, the opposite perspective in that I think it's a great opportunity for folks. There's a, a lot of chances to uh, enhance current processes that are in a, potentially inefficient uh, and make them more efficient through AI. Uh, to Bob's points, I, I think along with that, we got to take into account some of the risks associated with AI and make sure that we're, we're building uh, models in a way that um, Kind of addresses some of the inherent risks uh, with building uh, these models and um, as, assuming we kind of take into uh, practice the, the best practices and uh, creating these, I think we can um, create systems that you know generally will improve uh, healthcare uh, and health policy um, through their use. Great. Thank you, Devin. And by the way, just a reminder to our audience, this is uh, going to be an interactive session. We hope that you will use the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will take those questions from the q and I'm going to go ahead and I've got a few primed and ready to go. So let's just take my question first, some prerogative of the chair. And I'm going to ask Bob this question. Hey, Bob, could you tell us just in a general context, what is AI best used for 
And what should you probably not be using AI for just Great. in general? Well, um, let me tell you a story to answer that question. So when a patient goes into a ED uh, and needs an image for the, to make a disposition <clears throat> about whether they should be hospitalized or released, if it happens late at night, it's often a problem for an ED. <clears throat> and so how do you solve that problem? And well, one way is you could have radiologists on call and that works sometimes. Another way is that there are services where you can send uh, the image over to India and have highly skilled radiologists read it and get the answer back. But that could still take a few hours. Another way is a, a very ingenious company uh, that has started to use AI, but they don't use AI to replace the radiologist. They use the ra AI to determine, to discern if the patient could be released uh, for now and that uh, and can be uh, safe enough so that the read could be happen in the morning when radiologists are on duty. And I think that's a wonderful use for AI. It's a triage tool, a complement that supports uh, the physician patient relationship rather than something that would another application, another way to do it would be to try to automate the job of reading and replacing the role of the radiologist, which I think will not only uh, create uh, resistance on the part of this healthcare professions, but also is unlikely to produce the kind of results we want for patients and society. Great, thank you. Uh, Devin, we're going to have the next question for you. Uh, what are the challenges that you can foresee trying to leverage AI in the context of an all-payer claims database? It's a good question. I think a few come to mind to start. So one is it applies to really all healthcare data uses in that there's privacy concerns around the data that we're working with. So in the creation of any uh, AI model, we need to be cognizant of that and make sure that you know, wherever possible, we're uh, de-identifying the data that we're using to build that model. Because in, depending on the al algorithm you use, you may actually store some of that information. Uh, along with that, um, we need to be cognizant of biases in the data as there, you can perpetuate some of those biases based on the, the predictions that you make using biased data. So in APCDs, um, you need to think about you know, what data might be missing in the data. So uh, it could be uninsured if you're heavily relying on claims data. Uh, it could also be uh, self-insured uh, individuals. So you, you need to be cognizant of the data that you're using uh, when you build a model. And then from, um, I guess, a, a different perspective, depending on what types of models you're looking to build, uh, timeliness of the data can also come into effect. So uh, there's a lot of data that you can leverage to build a model with APCDs, but the data typically has some sort of lag time. So it's not always the best place to apply predictions. Typically you wanna make a prediction at a moment when some action can be taken to change an outcome. Uh, so if the data lags that you're trying to make a prediction on, uh, it doesn't always give you the best benefit. So you can build a model, but you got to find some way for you to access that model in a, uh, an area where a prediction can have an impact. Uh, so those are some of the challenges of, of building a model using APCD data. All right, thank you. So we have a question from Chris Craig. Let's go ahead and go to that question now, Charles. Um, Chris wants to know, how does the healthcare space advance AI uses in an ethical fashion when the data that is used to train the AI has a history of disparities? And is there a role for oversight agencies to help make the situation better? I'm actually gonna let you both take a crack at that. So Bob, if you wanna go first and then Devin. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a problem. You know, we're building the airplane uh, in midair. And yesterday the Biden administration announced a, a wide ranging set of initiatives about AI across the economy. And I think they are uh, sort of moving in the right direction. I haven't had a chance to review them all in detail, but the, the fundamental approach that they're advocating in healthcare is that the provenance of the data is documented, there's transparency, and there's the ability to opt out of AI, you know, awareness when AI applications are being used and the ability to not opt out. And they're building regulatory frameworks around principles like that. And I think those, those are good places to start. Okay, Devin, what do you think about that question? Yeah, I largely agree. I think there's not 
necessarily best practices in place already across the board. I think that's what that um, that uh, Biden administrative uh, administration uh, executive order is is getting at. It's trying to get to a place where we have guidelines that everyone can follow. Uh, I do think that there are you know, some things that you can do uh, currently to mitigate uh, some of those issues, and it's. The first thing is to be aware of that and make sure that you you test whatever you build uh, for those types of biases. And uh, I think best practice is always to to test what you build. Um, I think those are the, the big features. So we'll look towards kind of what guidelines come out as uh, the industry matures. Okay, great, thank you. So um, go ahead, and we're going to go back to a question that I had on prepped earlier that I think now is a good follow-up to this one, actually, interestingly enough. Uh, so from a health data organization perspective, so suppose I'm running an APCD or a hospital discharge database, and I'm hiring external consultants or contractors to do work for me. Um, is it possible that there is AI already embedded in some of those tools that I, as a health data organization, might not even be aware of? Um, and what types of AI might that be? Does that does that is that happening today in a way that's not necessarily transparent? I think this ties back to the rule about being transparent about when AI exists, and when it doesn't. Bob, what what do you what kind of places do you think AI already shows up in a way that people just might not be aware of? Well, I'm I'm not on the data side of things as much as you all are, but I think the presumption ought to be that it's already embedded in tools. It's and it's being used all over the place. And do you remember uh, in the 70s, 80s, the, in the environmental, environmental movement, there was a big uh, a movement toward right to know laws, right? That mm -hmm. people have a right to know if they're potentially dangerous materials stored in a work site and such. I think some version of that uh, is probably uh, salutary uh, in healthcare that people need to be made aware of when uh, artificial intelligence uh, or other forms of advanced algorithms are being used in tools they depend on and 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 should have the ability to investigate further risks they may uh, pose to the application they're trying to use it for. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Devin, we're gonna kind of go back now to the data side then, or stay on the data side. Um, as we all know, there's not, there isn't just one kind of AI. There's a lot of different kinds of AI out there. And so what are the types of AI that you as an engineer might be able to imagine could best apply in the case of an APCD or a hospital discharge database or any other sort of administrative data applications? Yeah, I think depending on the use case, there's, uh, to, your, to your point, or many different ones that could apply. So my comment earlier about timeliness of the data um, would point towards using uh, certain algorithms that are more descriptive of the data. So if, if, you, if you've got data that's uh, looking back in time, you, you might want to describe that data in some way. So doing some sort of clustering or um, grouping uh, algorithms to, to see which type of patient populations might um, be grouped together or uh, which organizations um, could be informal provider networks. So those types of algorithms to the for the healthcare data itself, I think there's also a lot of use cases around you know, the process of bringing data into the system that where you could apply a lot more different types of uh, AI models. So for example, uh, the data coming in the door, uh, there are things that you can do there for data quality checks where you might be able to automate some processes by building uh, more intelligent solutions, uh, and then likewise on the on the analysis side, uh, you could build some models to help users understand the data. Uh, I, I guess to that past or the last question around tools and AI being embedded in them, uh, a good example would be uh, Tableau. For example, has you know, its own AI uh, tool in there, which can help users understand. A report that they're looking at or you know put it in written language um, there'll be more of that you know, as we move forward okay. great thank you um we got a question here from don poe in the group chat um see if we can or yeah, the chat here and see if charles can you put that on screen for us i'm going to steer this to bob 
Don asks, how should liability be handled when AI informs or makes a decision that doesn't turn out how it should? Um, and how do you how do you impose accountability on a concept or on a system as opposed to you know, like the same way we would do to a physician? Well, I, I think this is a, 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 a that's a great question, and I think it's a question that's going to be worked out in real time. And I'll give you my intuitive answer to it, which is that AI is a tool, and so someone is using that tool. So whoever is choosing to use the tool, and there is an adverse outcome or a liability. Uh, the person who's choosing to use the tool uh, is probably liable for the consequences of their choice. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, legal and ethical issues to be worked through here, but I think that's a, probably a pretty good uh, uh, starting point for thinking it through. And it allows us to use what we already know and apply it to uh, this new problem. Okay, so you don't really necessarily think that the owners of the AI tools themselves have an obligation or responsibility or liability, I guess, in case their tool doesn't work as advertised? Well, they may be. Um, and, um, and so I, I think that would be depend on the causes of the failure or the, or the damage that's being done. If the, if the, if the cause is um, that we use the tool inappropriately or rely on an automated judgment uh, when there was evidence uh, uh, that a, a human judgment might have gone in a different direction. That's a different case than if uh, uh, the tool itself is flawed in some way through bias or through other, uh, through other means. So uh, all, I guess what I'm saying is um, we have frameworks for holding, uh, for holding people liable for the choices they make in the use of technology today. And I think those frameworks can be applied to AI as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Liz Davidson, from our good friend from Hawaii, has a question here. Charles, if you want to put this one up, but what are your thoughts on ownership of intellectual property that is created through AI initiatives and societal benefits that are possible? Um, that, I'm not an IP attorney, but we've had to dabble with this a little bit as we think about health data, and I'm not entirely sure. But Devin, do you want to take a crack at that first, and then we'll go to Bob for follow-up? And if you don't, have, if you don't, if this is outside your area, that's fine. We can we, we can push this yeah. off for another day. I think it's an interesting problem. I I don't have a strong stance on that one. I think it's yeah, I, I have probably a stronger stance on the other side of IP used um, for the creation of a model more so than what's created. I think you could make an argument that it is a unique thing that was created based on someone's unique. So if, if you use, for example, like an image generator, your unique prompt that you came up with, um, I, I think there is an argument there that there should be some rights. But yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area. Okay, Bob, what do you think about intellectual property and these AI health initiatives? Well, I, I'm also not an expert. Uh, I'm not an intellectual property attorney, uh, but I have opinions. And so I'm always glad to share my opinions. And I think that the, my, uh, my opinion is that we need to be, uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a part, AI is so new and has so much, so, so much capability uh, that in some ways we, the instinct is to throw up your hands uh, and say, I, we don't know what to do. But I think if we look through the way we regulate IP, there are principles and rule today, there are principles and rules that, that can apply here. They're novel cases. So, for example, if a large language model is being trained on uh, Barbara Kinsolver's magnificent new book, uh, Demon Copperhead, and that's part of the training set, and there's a question of, you know, is it an expropriation of her property to be using in the training set or not? I think those are really interesting uh, questions, and I think we have the principles in intellectual property law to apply to cases like that. Yeah, I do think there was a case recently that had to do with art where somebody had used AI to generate an artwork. And the question was, um, was the effort of the person actually creative? Um, and and that, was, that was an interesting question. And the courts concluded in that particular case that the artist really didn't do the work, that the artist basically just wrote some code and that AI did the work and therefore was AI, since AI couldn't own it, was in the public domain. And it was an interesting, so it's an interesting thing. I think you're right. I think we will figure this out over time. There are principles that would apply. All right, let's uh, go back to, I've got a question here. Uh, what could AI do for somebody who's in the business of data intake and processing? Devin, you wanna take a crack at that, so given your experience in data intake and processing? 
what, what could AI do? What, what problems could AI solve? Yeah, I, I used an example earlier of data quality validations and potentially ways to, I see it more as augmenting kind of staff and uh, maybe taking time away from repetitive tasks. Uh, if you can build a model to, to do make some of the decisions that individuals are currently making so that they can focus on other tasks. Um, a good example of, at least on the data processing side, of things that we do at OnPoint, um, our system is cloud-based and we, we scale dynamically based on the data that's flowing through our system. And uh, we rely heavily on, on tools like that AWS provides that you know underneath the hood is, is running based on predictions that they're making um, based on the data that uh, they're seeing submitted to certain applications. Uh, so we, we are using that to uh, be able to scale up really quickly when we need to or scale down when we don't need to so that we can save on cost and pass those savings on. Uh, I think those are probably the two, two biggest areas. Okay, very good. Um, and I, I will note, Liz notes here in the chat that she was specifically thinking about data governance and giving over personal health data. We'll, we'll come back to that one in just a second. Um, Bob, I want to ask you as a kind of follow-up to Devin's question. Um, let's see if I can find that. Um, AI as a positive force for disruptive innovation. We've heard people talk about disruptive innovation. How can AI actually make that happen, a catalyst for that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a great question. Um, so um, I, I, have a, I have an identical twin brother, and he and I have written a book together about innovation uh, called Why Not Better and Cheaper. And in that book, we lay out a, a kind of um, uh, uh, issue that really determines about uh, uh, whether disruptive innovations take root and spread or whether they not, and that has to do with what's called switchover disruptions. And switchover disruptions uh, are quite high when AI is used to automate a job done by providers or done by skilled professionals. Um, they are actually much lower and much different uh, when we think of AI as being a complement or a tool to say the physician uh, a patient relationship or the, the work of a skilled analyst. And so my advice to people developing AI applications is to try to use the narrative of complement rather than of automation. And, and I think uh, disruptive innovations will, uh, the disruptive potential of AI will be much greater to the extent the narrative is reframed in this way. Hey, very good, thank you. Uh, our NATO board chair, Kenley Money has a question. Uh, I will let either or both of you take a crack at this. Um, has AI been used to date to fill in the gaps with social determinants of health data? And are there some examples of out there how that might have been done uh, Devin, you go first, and then Bob, either of you are aware of any uses of AI to fill in data gaps? Uh, data gaps generally, yes, I, I think it, it has been. I don't know of any specific use cases. I think for social determinants of health, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know of one off the top of my head. I would say that there are some risks there uh, related to, again, biases in, in data. Uh, if you were to try and fill in that type of data. Um, and it, I, I think I, some folks would fill in that data statistically as well. So maybe not what you would uh, consider AI, uh, an AI algorithm to, to fill in, but a similar process uh, if you were to do a statistical analysis and fill in uh, blank data. So I don't have direct experience with fill, filling data gaps. In fact, I'm not exactly sure what a data gap is and how, how an AI would fill it. But I do have experience working with local government agencies on the use of data sharing amongst law enforcement, social services, health, and other agencies to alleviate specific uh, social problems, and particularly in the case of homelessness. And I can tell you that the big issues are not technical. There are pro process issues. There are systems issues that have to be bridged. It, one county I was working at was using 19, uh, 1986 version uh, computer systems. Uh, so there are those issues, but a lot of the issues are cultural. So the way police departments think about their data and how to use it and what it means is really different than the way 
housing departments do or health departments do. And their cultural norms, their legal restrictions, and those turned out to be really big uh, obstacles for the effective use of data sharing of, uh, of different types of data regarding social determinants of health and other right. outcomes. Yeah, and that's an interesting. So just to kind of maybe add a bit of color. So if you, if you have a data set that has healthcare data for a lot of people, but what you'd really like to know is what is their income? What is their education? Do they, how close do they live to a supermarket? You know, those sorts of things. Could AI in theory be used to augment your data set? And I think that I have my follow-up question that goes with this is if you go down that path, how do you know that the AI tool isn't just making stuff up as opposed to is making a reasonable effort to impute uh, the best value? I think Devin kind of alluded to that, that this is, it's an old technique, right? With just these imputed values coming in. But you know, you, surely an AI tool could figure out how to impute values. But how do we know that it's not just being made up? So let's see, Bob. Why don't you talk about that? And I've got another question for Devin coming up here. Well, it reminds me of my dog Louis. Uh, Louis is a wonderful dog. He's a three-year-old uh, uh, gold, golden doodle, uh, but he has a tendency to nip. And so, uh, when you know your dog has a tendency to nip, you have to take precautions when you invite people over to the house. And I think the same mindset works in this case. You know AI has a tendency to confabulation. Uh, there may be uh, future AI applications that can resolve that issue, but in the meantime, you've got to say, okay, I got a dog that nips. I got a, I got a program that I know is prone to make thing, making things up. So you have to take precautions and you have to always deal with the data uh, with a precautionary principle in mind. Yeah, I think that's good. And Sylvia calls them data hallucinations. So, yeah. but that's, I mean, this isn't, this isn't unique to AI. So anybody who ever tried to do imputation, right, has, this is something that we've known about for decades. All right, let's go back to um, the Q&A side. Charles, I think there's, a, my last question is, or my next question is loaded in there. And then we're going to go to Rachel right after that. So Devin, if you were thinking of designing, um, an AI focused or AI enhanced tool for data process, intake and processing. What are some of those design principles that would be important for thinking about including AI in that program? What would, from a design perspective, what would you be concerned about? Yeah, I think some of what we've already discussed. So around potential biases in the data and testing outputs to make sure that, you know, for example, that you're, you're You've got a reasonable distribution across certain data elements that you know and the output that you're creating so for example if the data uh, if you're worried about uh, biases and based on race then you you do some testing on whatever you've built to make sure that you can you know as reasonably uh, certain as you can show that it's it's not differentiating based on that where it shouldn't um, so a lot of testing would be really important in anything that you build. I think it's also important to, uh, make sure that as you're building an AI model that you communicate to whoever is using it and uh, what, what you found, where it's useful, where it's not so that people don't misuse, uh, what you've built, try to use it for something that it wasn't designed for. So that having some sort of communication around, you know, what, what were you solving for? Um, so that you, know, you don't use it for something else. Um, yeah, I, I think the continuous testing is really important. It, first and foremost, it make sure you've got it built into your process. And generally, anything, any AI model that's built uh, kind of has built in assumptions that may change over time. So I think anything, any AI model that you've built, you don't want to just assume that it's going to work uh, you know, a year down the road, you got to keep retesting it uh, and ideally retraining it over time uh, so that you can take into account any any hidden factors that you know might come through over time, but don't come through in the specific uh, pieces of information that you've trained the data on or the, the model on. All right, we've got a question from Rachel in the Q&A. Let's go ahead and pull that up, Charles. Uh, this I'm going to defer to Bob. What are some measures of equity that you would want to test for when working with AI programs? 
Well, you, you'd want to start with the ones where we know it, it, uh, it, we've already seen problems. You know, we've seen it with regard to race. We've seen it with regard to gender. Uh, uh, and there are probably others where, where there have been documented biases in the scientific literature. As a rule, I think, though, uh, uh, when working with AI programs, you know, I think we have to go back to sort of principles uh, and because it, it's all so new and work from the principles and work things out in practice. And I, I like the principles, you know, I mean, the Biden administration uh, uh, a few months ago, maybe longer, put out a blueprint for a, a Bill of Rights for AI. And I'm sure that's informed a lot of the, the activities of the last 24, 48 hours. Included in those principles would be one, transparency that, you know, uh, 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 when it's being used, when there's an AI application in use or not. The second is, you know, uh, provenance of the data, that there's an obligation, a positive obligation to, to display the provenance of the data so you can check to see about uh, equity issues. And the third is the ability to opt out. If it's built into an application or into a program or tool you're using, you should be made aware of it and have the ability to try to use it uh, and opt out of its use, and you can see what sort of uh, bias uh, uh, is revealed in that way. Yeah, so Bill comments here, we do work in this space. We train the AI model on validated data sets of consumer data, so we know that the data is valid before we train the model. And that's one of the ways you can deal with that. I think that's a very good comment, Bill. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go next to a question from Don. Um, should AI models, this is a philosophical question, I think. It's not more than more than technical. Should AI models that are being used in health data be open source so that the code and logic can be peer reviewed versus closed source models where the magic is behind the curtain? Devin, what's, what is your opinion as to whether the secret sauce should be revealed and they should be required to be open source versus allowing them to be closed source models? I think many of the, the at least commonly used models are open source at this point. There are a few that aren't. In a lot of cases, the actual algorithms are less important than data that they're trained on. So without you know, access to that data, I don't know how much information you'll get about you know, what that model actually will, will tell you or what biases might be in that model. Uh, so I don't know if it's a, a huge problem at the moment. I could see some you know, with other organizations or being built specifically to build certain data models like for example, the open AI with chat GPT, if they were to you know, close their system so you don't know what they're doing behind the covers, it could have a bigger impact. So I, I could see an argument for those type of situations, uh, making sure that not just the algorithm, but the process for training uh, is somewhat transparent uh, because there's a lot that goes in to building those uh, more than just uh, run this data through an algorithm. It's kind of many, many steps of running data, checking it. There's, in a lot of cases, there's manual intervention to correct certain issues with kind of what you've produced uh, through the automated process. Okay, great. We've got, we're going to get time for one more question from the audience. We're going to take this question from Ben Daly, um, give that to Bob. And then I've got a wrap up question for both of you. So, Bob, uh, if, if somebody implements AI, does that imply a significant increase in computing cost or computing resources? Well, so I'm, I'm really not qualified to answer that question. So I think we should pass it on to Devin or, or um, I can make something up, but then I'd be just like the AA applications. I'd be hallucinating. Yeah. Devin, what do you think? I think it depends on what you mean by implement AI. So if, if you're using a, a model that's already been created, there's typically not a high cost to making a prediction. Uh, really where the high cost comes in is training a model typically. So uh, building uh, an AI model is really, uh, there's a lot of upfront costs and in, in doing that training, putting in uh, time in terms of labor to set it up. And then the typical model is to then try and spread that across many predictions. You gotta reuse that model as much as possible so that uh, you gain back the value. Uh, so it would really be on the training side. And for that, it would be, um, yeah, it, it'd be a lot of uh, computational resources that would be the cost there. It, it does depend somewhat on the, the algorithms that you're using, whether or not there'd be a lot of um, 
storage versus computation, but typically it's computation. All right, so my, my final question to both of you, uh, we've talked about a lot of things. We've covered a lot of ground here in a half an hour. Um, anything that we've talked about plus anything else out there, what is the most important issue in your mind relating to the adoption of artificial intelligence? Um, Bob, let's have you go first and then Devin. Trust. Uh, if, uh, if I'm thinking about healthcare, um, and if providers or the public come to distrust these these applications, uh, adoption will be slow, and it will be um, uh, challenging. We have a history of that with IT innovations, IT based tools in healthcare. So I would say, if I had to pick one issue, it's the issue of trust. Great. All right, Devin, what do you think? Number one issue. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'd maybe dig in a bit more on the kind of figuring out some of the guidelines for ethical use, which I, I think builds that trust. But um, yeah, without having those guidelines and having some way to monitor whether or not a, a model is being built ethically or used ethically, uh, I think would kind of undermine any attempts at adoption. Um, yeah, I think we have issues currently, probably more so on the use side, it with uh, deep fakes and people creating, um, you know, plagiarizing uh, works through various generative tools. Uh, so if there's some, some guidelines and some rules around that that are somewhat enforceable, I, I think that, that helps the trust issue. Thank you. And thank you to our audience uh, for all of your comments and Q&A. I think it's been very helpful to have that interactive component with us today. Uh, so up next, as you saw on the screen, we are uh, our next session will be on November 7th at 1130 a.m. Eastern. And that will be Dr. Don Rucker. And I think Don's going to be talking about fire, or at least I fully expect Don Rucker to talk about fire. So I'll be surprised if he talks about something that's not fire. So It'll be fantastic. We ask, encourage you to join us for that one as well. Um, and with that, I think we're going to go ahead and close. Just a, just a reminder to everybody, of course, that uh, there is the game going on. You saw the game token appear several times. Um, if you want to get involved in that, that's, it's just kind of a fun thing to keep make sure you're on your toes. But there are prizes. It's actual. It's real money. Well, it's, it's Amazon money. So it's an Amazon gift card. So that's about as close to real money as we can do these days. We're, we'd love to have you involved in that, the game as well. And just thank our speakers today. I do want to mention also on Monday, um, after Don Rucker's comments, we will have Health Data Deep Dive. Uh, Bob will be available in one of our Health Data Deep Dive rooms for you to kind of talk together. I, I know this format is, is it works because you can chat in the, the type session. But if you actually want to talk to Bob, uh, pop into his room on Monday, and he'll be there to, to we'll have a, a small group of people be able to have a conversation more about, about this topic and other topics as well. Look for the other deep dive sessions on Monday. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Devin. Thank you. Thanks.